please let me introduce myself. My name is Tobias, and I'm the head of the technical pre-sales team here at LZ Labs. And I can tell you, I'm really proud and looking forward to talk to you this afternoon, lining up with people like Jürgen, Omar, Tilo, and of course, Corinne and Julian. Actually, Corinne was the one who called me two or three months ago, and she asked me, hey, Tobias, can you do the technical demo on the event? But you also need to do me one little favor. Don't be technical. And I was thinking like, well, a technical demo, showing a technical solution and don't be technical, that's quite a challenge. But I started to think about this and I thought about how, how I would represent the current situation of mainframe customers in the year 2022. And I came to the following conclusion. So you really might ask yourselves now, is that guy crazy? Is he going nuts? Is he really referring a mainframe to a coconut? Well, yes, maybe I'm a little bit crazy, but let me explain a little bit. Mainframe customers, have something that's really, really special. And this is called upward and downward compatibility. This means that there are applications that are running or were developed for old machine types of a mainframe and that are still running on the newest machine types. So it's actually not unusual to see applications at the age of 20 or even 30 years that are still running and that are still being maintained and develop. So literally, the application has been growing with the company. And whenever there is a new business process that needs to be covered, this is going to be implemented into the software and into the application. So all in sum, if you see and look at the business functions, this is something that makes you as a company unique. It's your company's DNA running in those systems. And this is what I'm trying to picture with the pulp and the coconut milk sitting inside that shell. On the other side, of course, looking at the long period of time, it's also kind of obvious that the application has become more complex. It has more dependencies to the system using system functionalities. So it's actually limited by the natural borders of the shell, looking at the coconut again. So customers who think of leaving the mainframe need to consider how they can move in a sustainable way the valuable assets, so the business logic, out of that environment and bring it over to a new modern architecture running on x86. So the basic questions at hand is how can we extract the valuable asset sitting inside the mainframe and move it over to the new x86 based architecture with a limited amount of risk? And the answer can clearly be given by LZ Labs and the software defined mainframe. So what is the software defined mainframe? The software-defined mainframe is an environment that allows your applications and the related data to run on an x86-based architecture in completely the equivalent way as it was doing on the mainframe world. And the way how we are doing this is we are extracting the pulp or the milk sitting inside that coconut. We are getting rid of all the dependencies to the shelf and the limitations. And without a change, we are moving this valuable essence over to the new world and to the new architecture. And as soon as your application is now running on that new architecture, it is kind of benefiting from all the assets and tools available in the new world. And this actually is the first step of our modernization journey. This is actually the binary rehosting or the modernization of the infrastructure. So I'm going to show to you how STM looks like, how it feels like to work with the system, 
And hereby, I'm using the web interface. Besides the web interface, it's also possible to use the command line or even our REST APIs. But for that demo, I will use the REST, uh, the web interface. When you log into the welcome screen, it's completely equal to what you are doing on a mainframe because you will reuse your existing TSO user and password, and then you are presented to the welcome screen. On the welcome screen, you have kind of the, let's say, highlights of the SDM environment. So you see jobs, which shows the active started tasks that are still in the status running, and it shows batch jobs that have ended, and you see the return codes. On the right side, you see the active regions, so online regions. And from here, you can see that I have three active online regions running, and you have our AZ relational subsystem, so our DB2-like environment with the name WDBS. The first perspective and the way how to navigate through the system is using here the job perspective. So we see the jobs here, and as I said, we see the started tasks, and of course, we see the batch jobs that have been submitted, and we can see the return codes. So I don't want to get into the detail anymore here, so let's get over to the next perspective, the data sets perspective. And this is also that's quite similar to a mainframe environment because we use first level qualifiers, second level qualifiers, and so on and so forth. So if I'm, for example, searching for a member that sits inside the folder or data set WinQA BC demo, I can change or use a filter and look maybe in the JCL data set. And inside that JCL data set, I'll have a member that is named Batch Java. And as you can see here, it is JCL, similar or completely equal to what is used on the mainframe. And this JCL kicks off a job that at the end cubes and squares a number and passes a name. You can see that here with the highlights I have done. So it's actually passing the number four and a name. To submit the JCL, I have several options. The first one is using the web interface and click on Submit as Job. The second one is, of course, using the REST API. And the third one is kind of connecting to a scheduler that is automatically scheduling that application. So for that demo, I will submit the batch job. I'll accept. Go back to the jobs perspective. And here you see that job ran. It has a return code of zero. And the result of that job is actually shown here in that spool R data set where it says, hi, coconut, here's your demo. Based on number four, we have 64 and 16 as a result. So a really easy program. But for the demo, I think it's well enough. The next perspective um, to have a look at is the LZ Online perspective. So on my system, as I said, I have three environments. And I am now connecting to one of these environments using a 30 to 70 emulator. So I click on Open, and I click to the IC07 environment on the SDM. So say Connect. And here I'm presented to my online screen. I'll enter an application name and, of course, a transaction name. And voila, here we are presented to a BMS map and this small application just tells me the ISO country code that is listed in a visa file. But as you remember, I should not be too technical. The beauty of that is that this is exactly a screen that would also be used on a mainframe application in the same way. Others, other perspectives inside that SDM environment is the hierarchical perspective for IMS databases, the relational perspective for administrating the DB2 or um, relational database environment. And for security, we have LZ Vault, where all of the ACF2 or RACF security definitions are stored. And you have the same security mechanisms as on the mainframe. On the system side, there is an option that is named Migrate, where you can see all the migration files that have been exported from a mainframe. And if I click on one of those files, I can see the data sets here on the bottom that are included in that migration file and that 
then can be restored and received into my system. And this is how migration works. We export things from a mainframe, we import it again to the STM environment. So far, we have talked about the interface of how to work with the software-defined mainframe. But besides, let's say, the commercial perspective, there's also the question often raised like, hey, what's, what's the difference here? Because people have still have to administrate the transaction monitoring solution. They have a DB2 or relational database environment to take care of. So what's actually the usage of this interface? The answer of that question is clearly nothing changes. Even if you have managed to get your way from a mainframe to the x86 world, someone who's working with a mainframe will quickly be familiar with this new environment. And even better, as we are now on the x86 world, we have access to people from universities who are used to work with x86 based technologies and they will quickly learn about this technology because they don't have to take care about the complexity on the mainframe architecture in parallel so the valuable knowledge that sits inside your employees that sits inside your mainframe specialists and the application can now be passed over to the next generation and this is what we call sustainability so let's do the next step. We have so far talked about the binary rehosting as a first step of our modernization journey. But what about development? Customers who are running on the software-defined mainframe need to be able to further develop and maintain their applications. And we offer them a solution based on Eclipse. This is named LZ Workbench. And by using LZ Workbench, you can still write, adapt, and maintain your COBOL, PL1, and even assembler sources. And at the end, you can do the compiling because we also offer the compilers so that you can put on the binaries to the SDM environment at the end. And again, you are now on the x86 world. You have various options. You have various tools available like Jenkins, Docker. You have tools like JIT to build up an automated build pipeline to do continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, whatever you want as you are now free in that new world. You are even allowed to spin up SDM in a virtualized environment to have dedicated system integration SDM LPAS for doing integration tests. And this is actually what Vipa Banker is doing. So it's amazing, this is really working. And within the next demo, I will demonstrate to you how LZ Workbench looks like. We will submit, again, the batch job that cubes and squares a number, and there's a terrible mistake inside that batch job. And we will debug the session to fix the error. So let me get back to my screen again. You can see here the basic interface of LZ Workbench. And Eclipse is based on perspective and views. So a perspective is actually the screen, the whole screen you are seeing here. And a few is that small little window, for example, that says Project Explorer. So all of your development projects can be managed inside that screen, or it can be managed by a SCM system that is connected to your Eclipse system. In the main window here, you have the editor, and you can see here I have a JCL. So this JCL, again, picks up a job cubing and scoring a number, and I'm passing over the number four. So I click Run As, launch the JCL, and then the job is being sent to SDM, and on the bottom here, on the left corner, you will see the result of the job where it says, Hi, Pineapple, here's your demo. Based on number four, we have 64 and 16 as a result. So why the hell is he saying pineapple? I want to be a coconut, not a pineapple. So let's look at the code. This is not feasible, right? This is not the way how it should look like. I have now opened the cobalt source. And you can see here on the right part, it's the outline view. And this outline view is kind of an overview of your source code. And the important thing I want to look at is the procedure division. 
Inside the procedure division, we have a paragraph that is named Hello Coconut. So this sounds really suspicious. So I'm clicking on that paragraph. And well, there is something like, hey, string, here's your demo. Uh -huh. So here's the part where something is written out to the console. So here I think the error is going to be. So I'm setting a breakpoint, going back to my JCL and say debug as and kick off the LZ Workbench debugger. So this is going to take a few seconds until the engine is going to start because it's working remotely. So we are going to present it to the debugging view right now. And we can see it's stopping at that breakpoint. So let's have a look at the current variables. So I go on the right side under variables and here under working storage area is a variable named welcome where we have ws hello and here it's the high pineapple variable so here is my mistake here is actually what went wrong okay i now know what variable i have to change so i stop the debugger i go back to my source code so this is the variable that has the mistake so let's see how that variable is defined. I click on that variable, and here you can see high pineapple. Well, no, it's high coconut. I'll save and compile and deploy it to my SDM. So this is all shown here at the bottom. So now the program has been compiled and deployed on the software-defined mainframe. And if I resubmit, Look at the spool, ah, yeah, now it's working. Hey, Coconut, here's your demo. Wow, absolutely fine, really fast fix for that solution. Perfect. Okay, so let's get back to the next topic. So far, we have covered the first step, the binary rehosting. We have covered how LZ Workbench looks like and we have fixed a terrible error. And the next step is, how can we modernize the application that now is running on the software-defined mainframe? And here's a really important message. We don't see SDM as the end of your application lifecycle. We see SDM kind of the bridge technology that it enables you to recycle your valuable asset on a new platform and open it up for modernization that is completely available and free on the x86 world. And I'm now talking here by the examples of real customers. So the first example is the microservice example. So the customer I was talking about, or I am talking about, has one application running on a mainframe and he wants to get rid of that. The idea is to get that over to an SAP system. The way the customer did it in the past was he tried to completely rewrite that application in SAP. So I'm talking about a part chain application, so a manufacturing company actually. But he failed two times because, as I said, a company uh, a application is really complex. It has really valuable assets inside of it. And rewriting this from scratch is kind of a high risk approach. So the way the customer is doing it is as a first step, he's rehosting this application on the software-defined mainframe. Therefore, he has no costs, so 60% cost savings compared to when running on um, the mainframe. And the costs he's saving can now be reinvested in modernizing the application. And what he's doing here, he's cutting down the monolithic application into small junkable bytes, so-called microservices. And these microservices, can then be consumed by the SAP system, which kind of uses all the standard functionalities that are quickly available in, in such a system. So the beauty of it is here that you can consume the valuable function sitting inside your existing application as a microservice, and you have the standard functionality sitting inside the SAP system. So you have an up and running system already. And if at one point of time, you want to get rid of that microservices, you can step-by-step step move all of these microservices into that SAP system, and you don't have the legacy part anymore. So this is the microservices example. Let's get over to the next one.
Java modernization. If at some point of time you decide to say, hey, I don't want my applications to be written in COBOL or PL1 anymore, you also have the chance to do a gradual and step-by-step -step modernization to Java. And here is another unique setting value of the software-defined mainframe. And this is, we can make Java applications interact with COBOL or PL1 applications sitting inside the software-defined mainframe. And the way how we do this, and sorry, Corinne, it's again a little bit technical. We have Java native interface, so JNI, and we are encapsulating all the C functions of the software-defined mainframe in the Java method, so that a Java application sitting outside the, the software-defined mainframe can maybe call a COBOL program. And using this technology, you can step-by-step -step extract modules out of your mainframe environment and bring them to Java, and you still have a complete operational environment. So all in all, these are some of the options you have when you're running your applications on the software-defined mainframe. And this is, as I said, our three-step-based modernization journey. We have covered in my presentation how the binary rehosting works, how it looks like as the first step. We have seen how we can do modern development using LZ Workbench, the compilers, how we can spin up maybe a DevOps, continuous creation, continuous delivery scenario, and at the end, how we can modernize the application targetedly on the SDM.